Welcome back to the North Tonawanda Football Hall of Fame YouTube channel. I'm Ed Holinsky. Have another great guest for us today. This gentleman is from uh, Youngstown, New York, the pride of the Luport Lancers. Uh, played in the 1980s. Uh, played with some great players like Matt Bradshaw and Daryl Johnson. He took a, after uh, college at Williams College in Massachusetts. He took the road uh, of becoming a uh, football coach, a college football coach. Uh, now in his ninth stop and his most successful stop from uh, Wake Forest, the head coach himself, Dave Colossen. Dave, thanks so much for joining me this morning. Well, Ed, thanks for having me on. Uh, brings back some great memories of the Niagara Frontier League and Newport and old teammates from uh, a couple of years ago. For those of the for those people who are not aware of your your background, could you give us a, a brief history of of how you where you came from and in your involvement in, in Louport athletics? I know you played you know basketball and football at Louport and excelled at both, and then took it to Williams College as well too. Yeah, I was born um, at Mount St. Mary's Hospital in uh, in Niagara Falls, Lewiston, that area, and. Uh, my dad worked for the old uh, Airco Spear that later became British Oxygen and the Carbon Graphite Group. So um, I grew up in, in Western New York um, and went to Louport. I played uh, football there for Harry Lawler. I played basketball for Jim Walker and I played baseball for Dan Maturko. And uh, I graduated in 1985 and went to Williams College. And part of the reason I picked Williams is they allowed me to play two sports. So I played football and basketball at Williams and thought I was going to get a, you know, a normal job or go to law school or do something like that. And I love sports so much that I thought I'd try coaching. And 34 or 35 years later, I'm still trying it. So it's, uh, it's been a rewarding uh, career, some highs and some lows. Uh, but I'm going into my uh, 24th year as a head coach. I got my first opportunity to be a head coach at Fordham University in 1999. And then I was at the University of Richmond uh, from 04 to 07. And then I was the head coach at Bowling Green from uh, 09 to 2013. And I've been at Wake Forest now going into my 10th year uh, as the head coach here uh, next season. So um I had to move a lot, but I've always stayed in touch with all my friends from Western New York, and it's still the area that I consider home. Who were some of the players that you played with at Louport? Well, you know, and it's funny, uh, I'm still really close with these guys, Ed. Um, but, you know, Alan Ilya is one of my oldest, dearest, closest friends in the world. Um, and Alan was a, a very underrated basketball player and a good football player. Uh, Matt Bradshaw, uh, I'm really close with Matt and really proud of the job he did at Louport and now Nichols. Pat Krozak is still a good friend of mine who's the head basketball coach at Louport. And Lenny Palumbo um, was uh, our starting center and a tight end for us. And uh, so there was five of us and we were really close. And uh, Jim Walker passed away about two weeks ago. And I got back uh, to Lewiston and, and was honored to do his eulogy. And all of those guys were there together. So I got to see Alan, Pat, Matt, and Lenny. And we all took a picture together. And, you know, Louport, 1984, 1985, that was the starting five in basketball. And in football, that was the quarterback, the tailback, the receiver, and the two tight ends. And 30 whatever 37, 38 years later, we're still close. What made the Louport program, football program, so good? I mean, we go back to the days of, of uh, the 70s of Pete Rayo and, and Harry Lawler took it over in the 80s. And what made that program so good year in and year out? Well, I, I think there was a tradition there. Um, you know, the two gym teachers at Louport when I were there were Pete Rayo and Jim, Wa and Jim Walker. And you know, Pete Rayo, when he was the head coach there, did such a great job and produced so many players. And then Jim Walker took over as the football coach for a couple of years. And then Harry uh, was just, he was an excellent line coach. And I think our teams were physical. Um, I, again, he, he took great pride in our ability to run the football. And 
we had good players. When you have a back like Daryl Johnston, um, you know, Harry was smart enough to give Daryl the ball. And, uh, you know, so I just think there was a, a community pride in the program and um, in the basketball program, too. You look what Jim Walker did and, you know, great players like Jim Johnstone and Nick Kaiser and Chris Matthews and Matt Bradshaw uh, that, you know, when I was at Louport in the in the 80s, um, we were known for having really good football and really good basketball teams and a great soccer program with uh, Rick Clausey as they uh, are. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Coach Clausey, not Rick. That's another friend of mine um, as the, the soccer coach who did a great job. So uh, there was definitely uh, community and institutional pride in, in the Lancer uh, sports programs. In football, when you played, it was the change over to the sectional format. But in basketball, I believe the old Niagara Frontier Leagues remained intact. What was your experience as playing some of those bigger schools and smaller schools in football and in basketball? Well, it was just some of the environments. Um, you know, back then, Niagara Falls had three high schools. They had uh, Niagara Falls High School. They, they had Trot and LaSalle. And we used to play all those teams in basketball and LaSalle and, and high school and, and football. And I think any time you went in, to Niagara Falls and played – uh, some of those schools that were very well coached and had great athletes, those were challenges. And certainly playing the Kenmores and the Tonawanda schools, they always had good athletes and good players. Um, you know, I remember going to Ken West and, and playing in the old pit. I'm sure, I don't know if that gym still exists or not, but, um, you know, I played against both the Bossarts, who were really good basketball players. And uh, in football, nothing beats the Friday Night Lights. And playing in the old, uh, you know, Hyde Park Stadium against Niagara Falls, so those are are, are great, great memories. And uh, our junior year, we had a chance to play Rich Stadium against Williamsville South, uh, which at the time had really good football programs. And uh, again, just I, I can still remember like it's yesterday, waking up that morning knowing I was going to start at quarterback at Rich Stadium, and all the anxiety and nerves and butterflies of what an incredible opportunity. What do you recall about your games against North Tonawanda? They just were always physical. Um, you know, North Tonawanda, you know, when you got done playing them, um, you know, you were going to need two days off. They, they were always big uh, physical football teams. I think our, uh, our senior year, we opened the season there. And we came from behind in the fourth quarter to beat them, uh, which is a, a good start to our season. Um, but they were just, you know, the, you knew you were going to you were going to have to show up and it was going to be a physical game. I, I remember their lines uh, and their linebackers always being some of the most physical that we played every year. Why do you think that Luport has such good success against North Tonawanda? Oh, I mean, it, it's it's hard to say. I mean, I, uh, you know, until you're bringing it up now, I never viewed North Tonawanda as a team that was ever an easy win. Uh, I think we were always up for that game. We knew that when we played North Tonawanda, you had to show up and play. And you had, you knew, like I said before, it was going to be a physical game. And uh, they challenged you. And those were games that we certainly got up for. Um, you know, there were certain, there's every game's a big game, but there's certain games that every year when you play them, uh, that you know what to expect. And, uh, you know, I always thought North Tana, Wanda, the physicality, uh, I remember playing against Niagara Wheatfield and Armand Cacciatore, I thought was just one of the, the great high school coaches in Western New York. He was always ahead of his time. And you knew that you know, he was going to have this knack of calling the right play at the right time. Um, and even playing the Grand Island teams uh, that back then in, in the mid 80s, you know, Grand Island, my senior year, they went to the sectionals and uh, and they had a really good football team. So I don't know. I, I just think, you know, New York football has always been a little bit under the radar, but I think there was a period of time there in the 80s that the Niagara Frontier League and had some really good players and some good teams. 
You brought up a point right there about New York football being under the radar. Got to ask you a question. I mean, since you're a, you're a head coach of an ACC team, why do you think that uh, more players from Western New York uh, don't go Division One? It, it's not um, culturally. It's not as important in Western New York as other places in the country, and I and I think a lot of it's for a good reason. And um, you know, when I, when I grew up and. I don't know if it's as much like that today, but, you know, we were always encouraged to play three sports. You know, the, the football players would then play basketball and then do track uh, or play baseball. And uh, I think in so many other areas of the country, whether it be California, Texas, and Florida, uh, young people, guys and players in middle school, are being forced to commit to playing one sport as early as seventh, eighth grade. And so forever in Western New York, uh, you know, there was eight games and that was it. And then there was eight games in a sectional and it took forever to get a playoff system. And so a player out of Western New York, you know, in his two or three years, if he played varsity football may only play 20 to 25 games Whereas the, the same high school player in California, Texas, or Florida was playing 14 to 15 games a year and they had state playoff system. So, uh, you know, again, there just wasn't the resources devoted to it. Uh, you know, a lot of those places, Florida and Texas, California, the head coach, uh, you know, might have the in-school suspension room or may have a job that, you uh, within the school that they can devote most of their time to football. And even to this day, when you recruit Western New York, the high school football coach, a lot of times is the history teacher or a math teacher, or, you know, still their primary job is still to be the teacher, not to coach. Um, and, and I think because of that, uh, a lot of players in New York don't have the resources poured into them that other areas in the country have. And, I don't necessarily think it's unhealthy. Uh, I think it's in some ways a good thing that you can play three sports and be well-rounded. Uh, but if your sole goal is to try to get a division one football scholarship, um, not playing as many games, uh, not having uh, a period every day that you're weightlifting as a football team or throwing the ball outside in 70 degree weather, like some of those Southern schools are able to do. I, I think it does overall hurt the development of the football player in New York. How about training facilities? It seems like these other states that you mentioned, these high schools, you're starting to smile already that some of these places are like the Taj Mahal, these high schools and, and their facilities and their stadiums and whatnot, as opposed to Western New York. Yeah, a lot of these places that I recruit, I mean, they have their own indoors devoted to football. Um you know, I've recruited all over the country now, whether it be uh, I spent, you know, half a decade recruiting the state of California and, you know, some of the programs out there like the the modern days and, uh, you know, the, the big nationally ranked programs. When you visit there, they're almost set up like colleges uh, that you have the head coach who's paid very well um, and his job is to win football games and you know, he'll have a, a staff of eight to 10 coaches that all get paid. Um, and they're run in a lot of ways like division one college programs. And so I, I think the approach in, in New York and Western New York might be, again, overall healthier uh, to have that balance and uh, to have that well-roundedness and allow guys to play multiple sports. Um, but it, it, there's, there's almost a, a facilities arms race going on in other places in the country. Uh, and, and Western New York has always had good basketball and really good soccer and good lacrosse. And, um, you know, there, there's probably, again, other sports that New York is known for. And, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, but again, it's never been really known as a, as a football state, although there are some outstanding players that come out of New York every year. Uh, they're just a little fewer and, and sometimes a little further between them. I want to backtrack a little bit. Who were some of your influences in, in high school, maybe coaches or other teammates uh, 
that you took things with moving forward and maybe apply some of their, their principles today? Uh, well, I, I was very close with Jim Walker, um, my basketball coach. Uh, you know, like I said, I just, we just lost coach Walker and, um, I, I went up to his memorial service, uh, but I had stayed in touch with him. He came down to Wake Forest and went to football games. He would text me after almost every game. And the one thing I always remember about Coach Walker is just um, how committed that he was to his craft. Uh, I always felt every basketball game we played that at Lewport, we were at an advantage because Jim Walker was on our bench. Um, I always thought we were the most prepared team and his passion for basketball was evident. Um, you know, Harry Lawler uh, is just such a good man. Uh, Harry Lawler might be one of the most ethical, um, well-balanced people I've ever been around that Harry never got too high, never got too low. Uh, he was the same person every day and, I think his teams were good because he was so consistent. And so both of those guys certainly had an impact on me. And um, as I moved on from Lewport, I certainly uh, w stayed a lot closer with Coach Walker than Coach Lawler. But Coach Lawler is someone I, I had great respect for. And like I said, every day with Coach Lawler, you knew what you were getting. And, and I try to do the same thing for our players. After college, you decided to take the route to become – a grad assistant, and then try your hand at assistant coaching. Was that a way for you to, I know it was a way for you to keep in the game. Was it a way to um, maybe mitigate uh, the fallout of taking the helmet off and taking the pads off and, and taking the spikes off for the last time or? Oh, I, I think there's no question. I mean, growing up as a kid and I was a gym rat. I mean, I'd get up in the morning in the summers and bike to the Red Brick Schoolhouse in Lewiston, New York, and we'd play basketball. And then, uh, you know, we'd walk to, uh, you know, the park in, uh, in Lewiston and play afternoon baseball. And at night, there was an Anjo travel baseball team or uh, summer basketball rec leagues up in Niagara Falls we'd play in. And that was every day until we got old enough to get jobs. Uh, and I mean, my life revolved around sports. And, uh, and again, part of the reason I, I chose Williams College and, and Division Three is they were gonna let me play two sports. And so you think you're gonna grow up and get a normal job. And as I got into my senior year in college and played my last football game, I just couldn't imagine not being part of a team. Um, I think that's initially why I got into coaching is I wanted to be part of a team. I wanted to be part of a, a group of people that had a common goal that were working together. And the same way that a Jim Walker or Harry Lawler had influence on me in a very positive way. I think any of us that get into coaching hope that we have that same type of impact on the young men that we interact with. And so again, in 1989, uh, I took a graduate assistant job at the University of Albany under a guy named Bob Ford, uh, who's a legendary coach. And I thought this would be something I would try and, and then grow up and get a real job. And 34 or 35 years later, I'm still trying it and, uh, and, and loving it. I mean, there's been a lot of sacrifice and highs and lows, but it's been a great journey. Describe the highs and lows because uh, being an assistant coach is not necessarily glamorous. The hours are long, um, almost like a nomad career, a few years here, a few years there. Um, you're at the mercy of the head coach, whether he maintains his position and staffs are cleaned out. Describe that, that, uh, that journey at uh, being a, uh, an assistant coach. Well, it, it has to be a labor of love and you have to enjoy the players you coach and you have to enjoy the strategic aspect and you have to enjoy recruiting. And um, there's been great highs, uh, certainly coaching at Lee high and working for Hank small and Kevin Higgins and winning two Patriot league titles in our three years there was incredibly rewarding being at Villanova 
um, and, and winning, going undefeated in 1997 and, and being able to coach great players like Brian Fenner and Brian Westbrook and Chris Bowden, uh, those are highs. And th- there's no feeling that replaces the feeling in a locker room after a great win with all these guys that you spent all these hours with. But, you know, I've been fired twice when I was at the University of Buffalo in 1992. Um you know, and it, our Sam Sanders stepped down and Jim Ward got the job. And um, after one season, uh, every coach that Sam had hired uh, got fired by Jim. And that was hard. I was in Western New York and uh, living where I wanted to live. Uh, and when you're told uh, you're no longer wanted, go, that's hard. And I ended up waiting tables for six months in Columbus, Ohio, uh, just to make ends meet. And uh, and then I went to the University of Tennessee in, in 2008 and had my first opportunity to coach Power 5 football and work for a legendary coach in Phil Fulmer. And the, and the season didn't go real well. And we were all fired that year. And uh, to be to go home and, and tell your wife and your kids that you just lost your job, uh, those are tough moments. But you just, you know, you take the lessons of sports, right? And you just get you keep moving. You get ready for the next opportunity, the next game. And uh, I think a, a lifetime of of sports um, allowed me to use both of those moments as springboards to something better. And uh, again, I didn't enjoy going through it. But uh, in some ways, I think those things probably help me and, and develop a, a mental toughness and, uh, you know, a, a thickness of skin that you need to survive in this profession. You've been very fortunate. And you, you, you came to Wake Forest in, in 2014, and now you've been to several bowls and enjoying some success. Uh, your school is not known as a football factory by any stretch of the imagination. It, it's more geared towards academics and, and uh, h- high standards of character as well, too. How do you compete against these these football factories and universities? Well, I, I've always believed that I, I think at every school uh, that there is a formula to win. And your job as the head coach is to figure out that formula. And so for years, and when I got here, I kept hearing that the size of our school Uh, the difficulty of the academics, both in the admissions process and the day-to-day life of our our student-athletes were the reasons that you couldn't win at Wake Forest. And in some ways, I thought those could be the reasons we would win, Uh, that we are the smallest Power 5 school. Uh, You know, the average class size here is 22, 23 students a school. So instead of saying that that's a negative, we just spun it around and said, there's not another school in the country that you can play this level of football and get this much level of personal attention off the football field. Uh, You know, we've been here now going into 10 years as a staff, we've never lost one player academically. Um, And good students who are good football players are attracted to Wake Forest. So the people that pick Wake Forest are ones that do value academics and do value the degree. And because of that, our retention rate and our graduation rate are really high. And in an era of transfer portal and name image likeness, you know, it's nice to be at a school that the value of the degree still holds a very high value. Uh, so we've been a little bit um, countercultural with how we've built it. You know, we don't get a lot of transfers. Uh, we still redshirt a lot. Uh, but we've ended up with some super fantastic football players, uh, one of which is playing in Western New York right now, Boogie Basham, who was a second round pick of the Bills, who we're really, really proud of. You brought up um, the transfer portal and, and name image likeness. Uh, b- before you brought it up, I was going to bring it up. What's your thoughts on both of those those trends now in, in college athletics? Well, first of all, I, I think, Uh, The players do deserve to be paid. Um, You know, college football, when I got into it 34 years ago in 1989, um, you know, 
they were student athletes and they got degrees and it wasn't the business that it's become. And I think when you look at, you know, what coaches are making and assistant coaches and athletic directors at the highest level of college football, I think it's really hard to say that the players uh, don't deserve to be paid. I mean, they are the ones that are out there working every day. Um, so I think, you know, the players being compensated for what they're doing is certainly fair and they, de they deserve it. Um, we just need to come up with a better system than what we're dealing with now. Um, really the way it's set up is all the payments through name image likeness are really through third parties. I think when name image likeness was passed, it was that you would truly make money off your name image likeness through outside deals. I don't think people envisioned uh, these collectives being formed with <laughs> millions and in some cases over $10 million uh, being pulled together in a pay for play model. And so I just think that uh, it's broken, uh, that the players do deserve to be paid, but we've got to figure out a better way of doing this because right now there's so much uh, tampering going on and it's basically unrestricted free agency. Um, and again, I'm, I'm all for players getting their market value. I just think uh, we need to come up with a, a better system. Uh, this thing kind of morphed in its own way. Um, and I, I don't think it's real healthy for the game. So hopefully uh, people ab above my level in this sport will come up with a better system than, than what we have right now. Do you believe that there's tampering in, in the portal system? <laughs> I don't believe there is. I know there is. So, um, and again, and, and there's legal tampering because uh, players are able to uh, hire name image likeness agents. And because these aren't their parents or there's not them, that people at other schools can negotiate with their agents directly. And it's, it's technically, it's, it's not illegal. It's not, you're not breaking a rule because you're, it's all dealing with third parties. And I think any system that involves so much use of third parties uh, in and of itself is, is not healthy. Um, if this is what we're going to do, let's just be upfront and direct about it. And, you know, in the NFL, you can't negotiate with a player before he's a free agent. Um, and in college football, uh, players are being recruited right off of your own rosters in the middle of your season. And so it's, uh, again, do I think the players should have the right to do this and they should have the right to go in the portal, but there needs to be some rules and some boundaries of when that communication can happen. What would what pieces of advice would you give to today's football high school football players on on how to uh, become the best that they can be? Well, I, I you know football uh, to me is a sport you have to love to do well. Um, you know, there's so much work that goes into it, and there's so limited opportunities to play the game uh, at Wake Forest and most Power Five schools. We work year round on football for twelve games. So if you don't enjoy the process of it, whether it be the weightlifting, the meetings, the practices, uh, you shouldn't do it. Find something you love to do and, uh, you know, don't force yourself into doing something because you think there's going to be a scholarship or some material gain. Um, but, you know, my, my advice would, would just be, you know, to... Uh, you know, understand everything that goes into it and the sacrifice that's required and enjoy the process of getting better every day. You know, when we have a good practice and players feel like they got better and improved, they're happy and they're in a good mood because they knew it was time well invested. Um, so make every day count, make every rep count and, you know, never lose an opportunity to grow as a football player. And, there's so many ways that you can grow in football, you know, whether it's film watching or clinicking or weightlifting, conditioning, practicing. Um, it's a sport that, that really there's so many different aspects of it that there's so many ways to improve your game. And the great ones do that. The great ones figure out every little way to get better. If you were just to concentrate on football, let's turn the clock back to 1985. And you were and um, you were a college coach, like you are today. Would you recruit yourself? 
<laughs> I probably ended up at the level I should have. Um, you know, I, I probably, uh, I ended up having a, a, a good career at Williams and, and got to play in some games and, and started a few years and it was a really rewarding experience. And I don't think playing at a higher level would have enriched the experience. Um, I loved my football experience because of who I did it with my teammates, my coaches. Uh, these are people that, again, going back to 1988, when I played my last game, 35 years later, uh, I had a Zoom call last night on New Year's with a bunch of my old uh, teammates. You know, there were six of us that got together and uh, had a Zoom call. And these are all guys that I played college football with. And, and so to me, what I treasure are the relationships the relationship I had with Coach Walker, the relationship I had with my college coach, Dick Farley, who I'm still in touch with today. Um, you know, the, you certainly remember the games and some of the wins and losses, but it's the relationships that are the most important thing you get from the game. So um, would I have recruited myself? It depends what level of football at Wake Forest, probably not. Um, I was not an ACC player, uh, but I, I probably ended up at the level I should have. One final question. We've talked a lot of, about a lot of different things. What would you like to talk about that I haven't brought up? Oh, I, I just think you're from Western New York, Ed. And uh, really, I've, I've lived in a lot of different places. I've recruited uh, all over the country. And I just, what a special place Western New York is. Uh, the sense of community that's there. Um, the people, how authentic they are. Um, like I said, I, when people say, where are you from? I say with great pride, Western New York. And uh, I, I try to get back every other year at least. And I, I still think the one of the most beautiful places in the whole country is that drive down River Road from Lewiston to Youngstown that you're overlooking the Niagara River and seeing Niagara on the lake in Canada. Um, and again, I, I know it gets cold there, but uh, it's such a beautiful place with beautiful people. Coach Dave Puss, and I know you're pressed for time, and I know you're a busy guy being the, uh, the ACC coach at Wake Forest. I appreciate your time very much. This was a lot of fun. Um, it was a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for your time. Be well, stay well, and go Demon Deacons. Ed, thanks so much. I'm really honored that you asked me to be part of this. And uh, I, I think I've been smiling three quarters of this interview because of all the great memories you're bringing back for me. So thanks so much for including me. Thank you.